It is therefore now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Just hours after the government tabled its election document last week, the Minister appeared on TVO's The Agenda with Steve Pakin. His comments, quite frankly, were shocking. It actually seems to us that the Minister had not read the budget document. What? Five times, what? Speaker, five times the minister made statements that weren't accurate. In fact, the polar opposite of those statements were actually true. The most egregious of those was to suggest the deficit was, quote, slayed, when he's forecasting six straight years of deficits and $32 billion more in deficits. How can that be slayed? Speaker to the minister, who does he think he's trying to fool? Mr. Speaker, we uh, underwent a great recession, uh, the largest in the world at this time. And many Ontarians fought hard to continue to provide some stimulus, and we partnered in that stimulus. We invested heavily, contrary to what they wanted us to do, which is to do across-the-board cuts and put the economy in harm's way. We went from a $19 billion deficit at the depth of the recession. So did the Conservative uh, federal government, Mr. Speaker. They had a 50-some-odd billion dollar deficit. We then fought hard to invest and to bring down that deficit, Mr. Speaker. Not only did we bring it down to zero, this year, Mr. Speaker, we have a $600 billion surplus. We're proud of the work that the people of Ontario have done to fight hard to bring our economy to lead Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Well, just as he repeated here, the minister on TV tried to claim the books were balanced when he first had to use the reserves, and good luck trying to convince the Auditor General of that, by the way, who has three different versions for him. But let's continue with the inaccuracies. The minister also claimed job creations numbers will, quote, be 140,000 every year. Well, however, when you turn to page 193 of the budget, it shows declines in job creation every year from 125, 121,000 this year, all the way down to 60,000 jobs in two years. It's no wonder that people think the minister did not read his own budget. Sorry. Speaker, to Question. the minister, why would Ontario voters trust him when he's they making don't. such blatant comments? Mr. Speaker, not only do we have a $600 million surplus this year, and third quarter results show it, and that's an independent review of the books of the government. That is what is provided, Mr. Speaker. Furthermore, it's independent economists and those outside of government that are saying this. We have a solid economic performance. Ontario's economy has grown more than Canada's and other G7 countries, Mr. Speaker. We also have the quality of those job gains, over 800,000 net new jobs since the recession, the majority of which are full-time, high-paying jobs in our province. And thirdly, Mr. Speaker, if the proof is in the numbers. Yes, Our sir. unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in two decades, and Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue fighting for Ontario. Uh, please. Uh, you say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Final supplementary. Uh, back to the minister. Well, the Auditor General quotes his numbers as, quote, bogus. The minister insisted, quote, we are the top in foreign direct investment. Well, Speaker, we've fallen to third. He knows this because I remind him in this legislature many, many, many times. Uh, and he seemed to be trying to calm the jittery markets by saying Ontario's debt to GDP quote, is remaining the same and then tapering down. Well, Speaker, the budget clearly shows our net debt to GDP is going up by half a point, not remaining the same, and not tapering down. It's, it's growing from 37.1 to 37.6 this year, all the way up to 38.6% uh, in 2021. That's just absolutely blatantly wrong, Speaker. So I would say to the minister again, why would Ontario's voters trust 
this minister, this government, and this premier when they're making such blatant comments. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, there are 50 states, 13 provinces and territories, and Ontario this year is number three of our foreign direct investment in North America, Mr. Speaker. Wow. That is pretty much pretty top of the, of the heap when it comes to supporting economic growth and investments in our province. And Mr. Speaker, our debt to GDP is an important number to assess. When we compare Ontario to other provinces, Quebec, for example, is still hovering close to 50 per cent. Ontario is indeed, as mentioned, 37.1 per cent down, Mr. Speaker, from a high of 39.3 per cent, and it was estimated to be at around 41 per cent. We have indeed reduced our debt to GDP, and we are indeed That's taking the necessary right. steps That's to right. benefit future generations That's from right. the investments we're making. Three saying? quarters of the That's debt right. that we are taking, Mr. Speaker, is for capital improvement, roads, bridges, That's hospitals, right. public transit, Thank you. things unable Thank you. to be competitive. Thank you. Yes, we're in warnings. I'll get a handle on it. New question, the member from um, Leeds uh, Thanks, uh, Premier. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, yesterday, uh, the judge in the gas plant scandal had some damning words in a sentence. My question is simple. Does the Premier condemn the Liberal government's affront to and attack upon democratic institutions and values. Thank you. Premier. Yeah. Attorney General. Well, Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Speaker, as I uh, have said this uh, before in this house, and as all members know, that, uh, that our Premier and our government takes the responsibility around uh, transparency and accountability very seriously. The member from Huron, Bruce, is warned. Does it, 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 that doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Carry on. Uh, speaker, uh, we are committed to being an open, accountable, and a transparent government. As a result, Speaker, from the moment the Premier have come, has come into office, she made sure that we strengthen the laws around accountability to ensure that there are uh, good policies in place uh, for document retention and speaker to train uh, all staff including the chiefs of staffs to ministers uh, so they know exactly what their responsibilities and obligations are under the law speaker that is how the government uh, should always operate and that is how our government is very much committed to uh, openness and transparency uh, as demonstrated by our premier and this government thank you supplementary well, uh, Speaker, I'm not surprised the Premier doesn't want to answer because the gas plant scandal has her fingerprints all over it. The Premier was the campaign co-chair. She signed the order in council, and then her first order of business yep. after the 2014 election yep. was to shut down the gas plant committee. Speaker, the isn't the Premier just as responsible for yep. attacking our Absolutely. democratic institutions? Yep. Speaker, no. Speaker, the the Premier has always uh, have always uh, uh, worked hard to make sure that our government is open and accountable. She, Speaker, promised and delivered on completely opening the government, right. and we have done so, Speaker, in an unprecedented uh, manner. Speaker, we have done things like sending directives to all political staff. We have developed mandatory training programs. We had appointed chiefs of staff who are accountable for record keeping. Speaker, we have improved archiving requirements. We've also, Speaker, brought in an accountability act that would prohibit the willful deletion Excellent of records act. and will create a penalty for doing so. Speaker, we have also have worked very closely with the Integrity Commissioner and the Information and Privacy yes, Commissioner. They have, in, in fact, have endorsed the steps we have taken, and we continue to work with them Thank to you. enforce these rules. Final supplementary. Uh, speaker, back to the Premier. Mr. Livingston attempted to thwart the core values of accountability and transparency that are essential to the proper functioning of a parliamentary democracy. Justice Lipson said. The member from Durham is warned, and the member from Barrie is warned. Carry on. 
Justice Lipton said Mr. Livingston's plan was to deny the public the right to know about government decision-making with regard to the gas plant controversy. Mr. Speaker, I want the Premier to answer, and so do Ontarians. Does the Premier condemn this Liberal operative's actions? Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, the Premier and the government is absolutely committed to accountability and transparency. And that is why, Speaker, the Premier and her government have taken concrete, decisive steps to ensure that we have the rules. Member from Leeds Grenville sworn. Carry on. Speaker, the, the Premier and the government have taken decisive action so that we have the laws, the rules, and the appropriate right. training. Okay. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is, is warned. Carry on. Speaker, the training is, is in place to ensure that uh, document retention is taken seriously and the rules uh, that are put in place are fully uh, complied with. Uh, Speaker, I just wanna, I want to quote, for example, uh, what the Information and Privacy Commissioner said. She said, uh, the uh, Commissioner at that time, I have appreciated the cooperation I have received from Answer. Premier Kathleen Wynne and the Minister of Government Services. The Premier issued a directive in accordance with the recommendations made in the report Thank you. and committed to government to committed transparency and Thank you. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, I asked the Premier a really simple question, but I couldn't get an answer, so I'm going to try again. Does the Premier believe that Ontario has a hallway medicine crisis? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, we have uh, demonstrated in our budget that we recognize that uh, because of growth, because of aging demographics, Mr. Speaker, that there is a need to make a substantial investment in hospitals in this province. $822 million, Mr. Speaker, which is the, uh, the quantum of, uh, of funding that the Ontario Hospital Association has identified is needed, Mr. Speaker. That's um, nearly 5 percent uh, increase, Mr. Speaker. So so we recognize that hospitals need support in order to be able to get health care to people more quickly. That's why that is in our budget, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, for years, the Liberal government froze and underfunded hospitals. The hallway med medicine crisis that we're fa uh, facing right now was absolutely, totally predictable. Overcrowding is the direct result of Liberal decisions. Yesterday, the Premier said to me, and I'm going to quote, why would the Premier of the Province of Ontario want to create a health care crisis in hospitals? That's a good question. Why did she, Speaker? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I did, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, in terms of the funding every single year uh, has increased in health care, Mr. Speaker. Every single budget, health care funding has increased, Mr. Speaker, every year. We have we have absolutely, in this budget, recognized a number of things, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the hospital funding that I just talked about, $822 million. But, Mr. Speaker, mental health supports are critical. You can't have good health if you don't have good mental health. And quite frankly, as a society, we are catching up. You know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Mr. Speaker, there was not Nothing. There was not nearly the awareness of the mental health challenges that there is now. So we are putting $2.1 billion, Mr. Speaker, into mental health. We also recognize that uh, with the aging population, there needs to be a continuum of supports. We have been investing billions of dollars into home care. We recognize that more is needed there. But also, Mr. Answer. Speaker, we have committed to building 30,000 new uh, long-term care beds. Mr. Speaker, there is a range of supports that we have put in this budget Thank in you. recognition of the health care. The there's cause and there's effect. The Liberals froze and underfunded hospital budgets. That is the cause. And now we have hospitals packed to the gills and people are being treated in hallways. That's the effect. Hallway medicine didn't just happen, it was caused. Why did this Premier cause today's hallway medicine crisis? Thank you. 
Member. Mr. Speaker, um, let's let's look at what uh, what some of the external analysts have said about what's happening in uh, in Ontario. So um, there are a number of third parties that have validated our healthcare system as one of the best in the world, and just uh, most recently the Kai High report that uh, has come out. But it's Kai High, it's the Fraser Institute, the Wait Times Alliance have all agreed that wait times in Ontario are the best wait times in the country, Mr. Speaker. Wow. That is not the result of an underfunded health care system. That is the result of a health care system that has been funded, that has been nourished, that has, been, that has worked in partnership with government to make sure that the investments are there when they're needed. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we have an aging demographic. The fact is that the health care system is going through a transformation. Yes, More sir. people want care in the community. We have funded that care, Mr. Speaker, but we know that there is more to do, and that is Thank why you. our budget has the supports in that it does. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Last week in Chatham, I met a young woman named Christine. She's a dental hygienist who owns and operates Bright Smiles, a community dental hygiene office. Uh, she saw how many people in her community couldn't afford dental care. They couldn't get dental care, uh, so she set up days uh, when anyone could come in for a free cleaning. People like Christine are incredible, and I congratulate her for her big heart. But we can't build dental care on people who are willing to offer care for free. Why doesn't the Premier have a plan to get people the dental care that they need? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, again, I, I appreciate that the leader of the third party is now starting to talk about dental care. We've been working on putting in place supports through the Healthy Smiles program, expanding that program, Mr. Speaker, working with the uh, the uh, dentists in this province to to fill what is, quite frankly, a gap in Medicare. Uh, as I've said many times, Mr. Speaker, if we were building a Medicare system today in this country. Pharmacare and dental care would be included. They were not, and so what we are doing here in Ontario is we are taking steps to make sure that people get the care they need. Last year, with OHIP Plus, Mr. Speaker, we made the biggest step forward in uh, expanding Medicare in a generation. Uh, all children from birth till their 25th birthday receive full, uh, free prescription medication, Mr. Speaker. All medication. 4,400 medications that are on the formulary. Yes, Not a few medications, Mr. Speaker, but all of the medications that are on the formulary. And I'll speak more about the dental plan in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, when I was at Bright Smiles, I met a gentleman named uh, Justin, who was there with his daughter. His daughter had five cavities. The Premier's plan to give Justin 50 bucks for five fillings doesn't fix the problem. But Justin told me that dental care for everyone would. Here's what he said. Uh, it means an end to the terrible stress we feel every time the kids need medicine, a checkup at the dentist, or a filling. That's what Justin told me. Why is the Premier ignoring the dental needs of Justin's daughter? Thank you, Premier. Quote is, that quote is very telling because um, the stress about medicine is no longer something that uh, Justin has to worry about. And I, you know, I have every sympathy for a family that can't afford to uh, get the prescription medication or the dental care for their children. So that's, you know, that's a good thing that now that family doesn't have to worry about paying for prescription medication. And Mr. Speaker, let's be honest about what the, uh, the plan is that we've put forward. It's $700 for a family of uh, two adults and two kids, Mr. Speaker, and that $700 can be used to offset costs. I know it is not it's not perfect. I know that a full uh, national dental care plan would be perfect. I know that a full pharmacare plan would be perfect, Mr. Speaker, but we've taken huge steps forward. We will continue to move forward in this province as we work to fill that gap in Medicare that, uh, that does need Answer. to be filled, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, getting your mouth looked after should not be a luxury. It should be a fact of life in our province. As a country, we've decided that everyone should be able to see a doctor when they're sick, not just when they can afford it. I think people should be able to see a dentist too, Speaker. Why doesn't the Premier? Thank you. 
Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as the Premier said, we do welcome the third party coming uh, to these conclusions uh, in the recent uh, past. Uh, of course, we have, as we've said so many times, our new Ontario Drug and Dental Program, but we're building on what we've achieved over the last many years, our Healthy Smiles Program, some 470,000 children that can access important dental services. And of course, this number continues to grow because we continue to expand the program. And so since 2016, the amount of children enrolled in the Healthy Smiles Program has increased by some 45,000 children. We have more to do. We also support Answer. public health units in a number, some 200 clinics that public health actually provides for dental care across this province. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. My question is uh, for the Premier. The CEO of Hydro One has been handed a $1.7 million bonus. All in, his take-home pay is now over $6 million. Wow. This is unacceptable at a time when seniors are fearful of heating their homes, when businesses are shutting down, when taxpayers are suffering, all due to skyrocketing hydro bills. Mr. Speaker, how can the Premier continue to support her $6 million man? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I, um, you know, I, uh, I know that uh, the uh, leader, not the, inter not the house leader, but the, the leader, Mr. Ford, um, is talking about firing the uh, the CEO of Hydro One and firing the board. I think that I think that has, uh, is something that he has said he, he was going to do, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have no idea how that will help any any person in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that uh, that will not take one cent off anyone's electricity bill. Um, and, you know, there's a guy in the, in, to the south of us, Mr. Speaker, who is governing by firing, and I'm not sure that's going so well. So, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, the reality is that we need to know Answer. we need to know what this party is talking about when they're talking about how they are going to run the electricity system in this province, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. What's the plan? Yeah. How's that going to work? Uh, back to the Premier. Our PC leader, Doug Ford's first action as Premier will bring an end to this outrageous Hydro One contract. The PCs will use every power at the disposal of this government to remove the $6 million man as well as the entire board. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier support removing her $6 million man? Thank you. <laughs> it, it must be a bit galling for the, uh, the member opposite to have to stand up and put that out as policy. Yeah. You know, Mr. Speaker, policy is about how things actually work. Policy is about how you get supports to people. Policy is about how do we build this province up so that it has a bright economic future. That's not policy, Mr. Speaker. That's a slogan masquerading as policy. Warnings are still in effect. No question. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, 3,000 York University TAs, RAs, and contract faculty are still on the picket line. They're taking a stand against insecure academic jobs and the chronic underfunding of our post secondary system, even if this Liberal government is not. When the member for Welland raised this issue earlier this week, the minister said she was urging both sides to get back to the table. Speaker, one side is at the table and has been for the last six weeks. Yet York University, a publicly funded institution, sat down for just one day of bargaining. Now, instead of negotiating with their employees, they have requested binding arbitration. Will the Premier step up, show some leadership, and direct York University to get back to the table? 
Thank you. Advanced education and skills this development. Advanced education. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite for the question. Um, this is a, a situation that is concerning, Speaker. It involves uh, our students, and, uh, and we know that the priority has to be to settle this uh, agreement and, uh, and focus on students' uh, ec education. Mr. Speaker, my call to both sides in this situation is that they get back to the table and recognize that compromise is needed on both sides. And if we put the needs of the students first and their learning, Mr. Speaker, I ask both sides to do that and to, uh, and to come to an agreement that is fair for, for both parties. Collective bargaining is something that we support on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and we're really calling on both sides in this instance uh, to come together, to come to the table and discuss an agreement that is fair to both sides, and that might require compromises on both sides Answer. so that we prioritize the needs of our students and, uh, and that they can complete their learning, Mr. Speaker. Thank that you. is what we're Supplementary. Asking. Speaker, the integrity of the bargaining process is not the only issue at stake. The root of the problem is years of underfunding of post-secondary education in Ontario, now the lowest in the country, that has led to an explosion of insecure, unstable and low-paid academic jobs and undermined the quality of post-secondary education. It's not only Carleton and York where these issues have come to a head. Western graduate teaching assistants may soon be on strike and other universities may follow. Ultimately, as we know, it is students who are most affected by these labour disputes. Speaker, after 15 years in office, why has this Liberal government allowed Ontario to sink to the bottom in terms of per-student funding for post-secondary education? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, you know, the, my primary concern in this situation is for the students. It's very important that we focus on getting both parties back so that they can come to a fair agreement and the best agreements are done at the bargaining table. But, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is simply wrong. When she talks down our post secondary education system, Mr. Speaker, Ontario has a world class, recognized education system at the post secondary level, Mr. Speaker. And you know what, Mr. You Speaker, we have made, under the leadership of our Premier, historic investments with the new transformation of OSAP. 235,000 students are going to school with free access to tuition, Mr. Speaker, under that program. It's creating more access. 34 per cent more Indigenous students are accessing post-secondary through the new OSAP. Wow. We have more lone parent households accessing, Mr. Speaker, Thank and you. we're going to continue to build up our education. Yeah. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. This weekend, Ontario will celebrate its four-year anniversary of the phase-out of coal-fired power plants. This move remains the single largest greenhouse gas reduction initiative completed in all of North America. The elimination of coal-fired plants has been a major contributing factor in improving the quality of air that we breathe. Thanks to clean air and clean energy, Ontario has saved more than $4 billion in annual health and environmental costs. We also saw the number of smog days drop from 53 in 2005 to zero in 2017. Can the minister please explain Question. how the elimination of coal-fired plants places Ontario in a competitive advantage? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, I want to thank the member from Barrie for that question and, of course, for all of her hard work. You know what, Mr. Speaker? Our government is proud to be a leader in the global fight against climate change. And as of last year, the electricity that we consume is over 95 percent carbon free thanks to the early action we took to close coal fired power generation plants, Mr. Speaker. The overwhelming consensus is clear from climate and health experts, both in government and in independent organizations. This has resulted in significant reductions in air pollution and improves the lives of the people of Ontario.
And just earlier this week, Mr. Speaker, the Environmental Commissioner released a report in which she praised our government's action on eliminating coal, saying that taking coal out of the electricity system has dramatically reduced Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions and has improved Answer. air quality and public health, Mr. Speaker. So as you can see, unlike the official opposition, our government is taking concrete action Thank to you. ensure that our kids and grandkids can breathe clean air. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. It is wonderful to hear that our electricity generation in 2017 was over 95 per cent free of the emissions that cause climate change. I understand this is thanks to the nearly $70 billion that has been invested to modernize the system since 2003. This benefits the people of Ontario today by ensuring that we have clear air, clean air. In 2012, the last year of the coal-fired power in the province, we had 30 smog days. In the six years since, we've only had three. These investments have also provided good jobs and opportunities to invest in future generations. I understand that the Lakeview Generating Station, a former coal plant, has been sold. Can the minister please provide details what the sale of this man land means to the province? Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You I'm very pleased to talk about the sale of the Lakeview lands. Not only does this site, 177 acres, give us a chance to trans transform those industrial lands into a waterfront destination where people can play and work and raise a family. The former coal plant, the Four Sisters, as it was known, was the worst polluter, a generation of pollution, and now it's generating over $200 million to the Trillium Trust, money that will be reinvested in public transit, transportation, and infrastructure right across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this is part of our $230 billion over 14 years to build Ontario up. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to also acknowledge that Inspiration Lakeview to revitalize this precious waterfront will enable mixed use and enable our local community to do better. We've had over 30 to 40 smog days in the past. As a result of these initiatives, we've had zero this year, Mr. Speaker. And the late Jim Tobin, who just died yes, a few months ago, was a champion for Inspiration Lakeview, and I want to acknowledge his efforts Thank in you. our community as well. Good question. The member for Whitby, Oslo. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Speaker, this is the sixth week that more than 51,000 York University students are not in class. 51,000 students, Speaker. The Liberal government failed to act last fall when they let the community college strike go on for five long weeks, putting the student semester in jeopardy. Yet again, the Premier and the Minister have failed to show leadership for Ontario's post-secondary students. Speaker, how many more weeks of class will York Uni Uni University's 51,000 students have to miss before the Liberal government takes action? You know, Speaker, this is a, a very challenging situation, and I know that students are feeling the effects of the strike. But, Mr. Speaker, the university has worked to keep the school open so that a, a portion of their students can continue uh, while the strike is happening. I know this is difficult on all parties, Mr. Speaker, but the school has remained open. What we are asking here is that both sides return to the bargaining table, that they think about what compromises can be made on both sides so that they can come to a resolution that is fair to all parties, that is fair to both sides. The best deals are done, that's what we believe, on this side of the House at the collective bargaining table. We respect the bargaining process, and at this point, we're yes, asking sir. both sides to come back and to strike a fair deal that is fair. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Speaker, on April the 10th, 2018, the president of York University wrote a letter to the Canadian Union of Public Employees asking that this matter be sent to binding arbitration. The letter said, Speaker, in just over one more week, we will be facing a possible loss of a summer term with even further consequences for our students. Speaker, will the Liberal government act now to save the semester of 51,000 York University students? Thank you. Minister. Minister of Labour. 
Mr. Labour. Speaker, thank you, and thank you to the member for the question about York University. Speaker, it's at times like this that we need to remember that Ontario's got one of the best track records when it comes to collective, uh, collective bargaining, Speaker. Absolutely. Between 98 and 99 percent of agreements year after year are reached without either of the parties having to resort to a strike or to a lockout, Speaker. Correct. Speaker, this is an exceptional circumstance. Both sides obviously are availing themselves of their right under the process, but I would ask members to remember that the process needs to be respected. The best deals, the best long-term deals in the interest of the students, in the interest of the employees, in the interest of the people that run the, the um, administration at York University, Speaker, is best reached by all those parties coming to an agreement around the table. We're confident, Speaker, that if the right attitude is brought to this, That's that it. agreement can be reached and the students can be put first, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the leader of the uh, third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the acting premier. Uh, in her new budget, the Premier proposed that the province assume ownership of Toronto's subway lines. This is the same idea one former Conservative leader floated back in 2014, which was roundly condemned at the time by Toronto City Councillors, the TTC, transit advocates and the public. It is also the same idea that the Conservatives are floating in their current plan, which again has been roundly condemned. Why would the Premier even consider breaking up the TTC, Speaker? Thank you. Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of the Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I appreciate the, uh, the question from the member opposite. Speaker, the uh, TTC subway system has, uh, has been an incredible bonus to many, many residents in Toronto. This is a, a very much a world-class transit system, and we continue to operate it and uh, collaborate with the City of Toronto to make sure that we can continue increasing service and continue to increase world-class um, world service on this line. I know that with the increasing costs, as we continue to build this system out, there has been some discussion amongst all of our different stakeholders regarding the cost of running the subway and how best to, uh, to offset it. These discussions uh, uh, are just starting to see if it is Answer. feasible that we will be uh, entering into any agreement with the City of Toronto, but these discussions are worth having in the short term. Thank you. I'll answer more in the supplementary. supplementary. When the TTC is properly funded, Speaker, it works. When the province paid 50 per cent of the TTC's operating costs, it was the envy of the world. The TTC works because the buses, streetcars and subways all work together in an integrated network. But now the Premier is proposing to take a page from the Conservatives, the same people who filled in a hole where the Eglinton subway should be, and then cut off provincial funding for TTC operations. The Premier is proposing to break up the TTC. Will the Premier stop listening to the Conservatives and start listening to transit riders who want their trans transit system to be properly funded, not broken up? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And we're continuing to move forward with an unprecedented transit build in the GTHA, much of which is taking place right here in Toronto. And if the member opposite was listening correctly, she would hear that some of the announcements with the uh, integrated fare announcement, with the continuing transit build of, uh, of uh, Smart Track as well as GO stations and RER, unprecedented historic build outs. But specifically, the province will begin discussions with the City of Toronto to determine whether provincial ownership of TTC subway lines could better uh, to provide better transit services for residents in the GTHA, but also allow for a better sharing of costs for transit expansion between the province and the City of Toronto, and we are very happy to have those discussions. I want to be clear at this time we're engaging with the City to consider what options are available and what could lead to the best results for transit uh, users, and any decision that we made will be based, on, be based on evidence will happen in collaboration and consultation with the City of Toronto. While we appreciate the NDP's ideas on support for multiple transit operations, Answer. the NDP proved once again they have no real plan on helping to build the much-needed transit in this city.
<laughs> New question. Member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Minister, the Tamil people of Sri Lanka have suffered persecution by their government continuously since independence in 1948. The Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam were created as a military body to protect the Tamil people. The Tamil Tigers were a strong fighting force. The Canadian government was persuaded to place a terrorist designation on the Tamil Tigers in 2006. The civil war in Sri Lanka ended in 2009 with the complete decimation of the Tigers. The terrorist designation is not needed anymore. Minister, will you support the request of Tamil Canadians to ask the Government of Canada to remove the terrorist designation? Thank you, Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills, for the question. And the member is correct. This is an issue that is solely under federal jurisdiction as public safety falls under their purview. I sympathize with the community for the tragic decades-long conflict which ended in 2009. The tragic war in Sri Lanka resulted in unnecessary loss of tens of thousands of civilians' lives, many within the Tamil community. As Canadians, we remain committed to the values that we cherish, justice, human rights, and fairness, both in Canada and in Sri Lanka. Countries like Canada have all recognized that grave atrocities took place during the war in Sri Lanka. Ontario does as well. Our focus as a government Answer. is our engagement with the northern province of Sri Lanka, as well as the vibrant Tabo community here in Ontario, and I'll elaborate in the supplementary. Supplementary. Minister, the terrorist designation on the Tamil Tigers still exists. It is like a black cloud hanging over the heads of Tamil Canadians. The terrorist designation effectively causes a social stigmatization of Tamil people in Canada. Tamil people cannot even publicly mourn and remember their fallen people at their Mavarir Nal remembrance services on November 27th of each year. The Tamil Tigers no longer exist. They will never be a fighting force again. Minister, will you come to Parliament Hill with Tamil Canadian leaders and me to ask the Canadian government to remove the terrorist designation. Thank you. Minister. And, uh, um, thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the member for the question once again. Mr. Speaker, our Premier was the first head of government uh, in Ontario to host the Chief Minister of the Tamil-dominated Northern Province of Sri Lanka during his January 2017 visit to Canada. And this was an opportunity for the Premier to convey Ontario's strong interest in seeing and supporting further progress in strengthening this relationship. Following their meeting last year, there was a continued dialogue between our two jurisdictions, and just this week, the Premier sent a letter to the Chief Minister proposing a possible memorandum of understanding on women's economic empowerment. Mr. Speaker, one of Ontario's greatest strengths is the diverse mosaic of our people, and we are proud of our vibrant Tamil community yes, and the contributions that they have made that, that they continue to make in all fields to our province. We were also the first to declare as a, a legislature the Tamil Heritage Month. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. Our government is investing more in care and services that people across Ontario rely on. I'm proud that our government is committed to easing the pressure families are facing by taking action to improve mental health supports in schools. We know that nearly one in three Ontarians will face a mental health or addictions issue over the course of their lifetime. This includes the two million young people in our schools, reflecting the future of this province. In my riding of Kingston and the Islands, I represent a diverse group of people who have courageously shared their stories of themselves, their friends, or members of their family facing mental health challenges. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what is our government doing to support well-being and a better 
brighter Question. future for the students of Ontario. Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kingston and the Islands for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, we know that our fast-paced lives mean that our young people today are dealing with increasing demands and pressures, and those challenges can mean our students are dealing with serious stress and anxiety in their lives. That's why our government recently announced an additional $2.1 billion for mental health and addiction services in Ontario. This is the largest provincial investment of its kind in Canadian history. So just think about that. For our students and educators, these funds mean more support in our school community and more help. In fact, our budget adds 400 mental health workers to high schools across the province, enhances our educators and staff school mental health literacy, and equips our students with social-emotional yes, learning skills beginning as early as in kindergarten. Speaker, our students can't learn or be successful if they aren't happy and healthy and well. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that is driving student success with more classroom supports. I know that we are doing more to better prepare children for the future by investing in care and not cuts. We can't afford to cut vital services that mean so much to students, their families and staff. $1 billion in cuts from our schools will mean that at least 7,000 teachers early childhood educators and educational assistants would be fired, putting all of this progress in jeopardy. Adding 400 new mental health workers in schools is part of our government's plan to support care, create opportunity, and make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us more about what our government is Question. doing to support student well-being in our schools. Thank you, Minister. Thanks again to the member for the question. Speaker, we know mental health challenges can begin at an early age. In fact, experts say up to 70 per cent of mental health and addictions issues begin in childhood. That's why it's important, Speaker, to make sure supports are there when students need them most. In fact, educators can often recognize if a student might be struggling with a mental health concern, like panic attacks, anxiety or depression. That's why our plan puts direct supports in place in the classroom, in the curriculum, and on school boards. We want to ensure that our young people get the tools and resources they need to be able to meet their mental health challenges. So we're adding 2,000 more educators to our schools, including psychologists, social workers, and guidance counselors, and increasing education funding by $625 million starting next year. Mr. Speaker, we heard from students that these are the supports they need to be successful, and that's why students are at the center of this historic announcement towards mental health supports. Thank you. The question, the member from Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, industry experts as well as environmental advocates in my riding and across the province tell me that they continue to receive template responses from this government when it comes to concerns raised over the closure of the Ontario tree seed plant. The decision to close the facility was made by this government without any consultation with the industry or the broader community. The government talks about a supposed new tree seed archive, but we've heard nothing about it. What we do know is that a new archive will not support tree planting of any sort, and that with the closure of the tree seed plant, the government is divesting the province of expertise, facilities, and a network of people that will be gone forever. Mr. Speaker, Without the Ontario tree seed plant, how does the government plan to ensure a sufficient supply of high-quality, source-identified seed for dozens of native tree Question. species throughout the province? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you for the question. Actually, the, the program that we are putting forward is to actually modernize the way in which uh, tree seed will be distributed in, in uh, Ontario. It will be a better program that will be cheaper for Ontarians and will respect the quality that we want in the tree seed plant. We are committed to biodiversity and ensuring our natural heritage committing to ensuring that Ontario seeds continue to be used in forest planting. So we knew that indeed uh, 80 per cent of the market was uh, done, uh, of the seeds were provided by the private market, and we are 
actually moving forward in creating a better a program for uh, Ontarians in that uh, respect. So I think I'm happy to provide more details in the supplementary. Thank you, supplementary. Back to the uh, minister. Uh, tree growers across the province remain concerned where they will find appropriate seed needed for future crops. They say the consequences will be an influx of unidentified seed sources into the Ontario market that favours cost over quality and adaptability. This works completely against the minister's new seed transfer policy. So they asked me to ask you, how will the government ensure that the private sector develops the capacity to plan for, collect, process and bank enough seed to respond to catastrophic events in Ontario, such as beetle and forest fire devastations? And can the government assure growers that the private sector will readily replace seed in time for normal annual reforestation projects? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, I think we have uh, uh, there's two instruments that the government has at this disposition. First of all, there's the seed uh, zone policy that ensures that actually you provide the seeds in the appropriate zones in Ontario and ensuring that the appropriate uh, uh, trees are being planted. So we want to preserve the natural heritage in doing so. We also have the what we have called the new genetic archives that is in the way, and I will certainly continue to uh, work with you in trying to ensure that it does meet the needs of Ontarians. I think the government is actually quite uh, involved in ensuring that we have a modern system that responds to the range of needs for Ontarians in sea planting. We continue to be committed to ensuring biodiversity, but also respecting our natural heritage in Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much. And my question is to the acting premier. On Tuesday, the Minister of Transportation claimed that this government has already passed vulnerable road user laws. But road safety advocates across Ontario, including Friends and Families for Safe Streets, Cycle Toronto, Walk Toronto, Bike Law Canada, have repeatedly pointed out that th this is not true. They have pointed out that in the vast majority of cases, a driver who seriously injures or kills a cyclist or pedestrian would not even be charged with a new careless driving offence but will plead down and escape any meaningful consequences for their actions. This happens every day. Will the acting premier or the minister of transportation or anybody on that side of the house commit today to fast-tracking Bill 37, which is a true, comprehensive, vulnerable road Question. user law? Thank you. Acting premier. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Uh, it's amazing to me that uh, even the information I gave this member on Tuesday, she has not recognized that we passed a bill that our law enforcement officers were asking us to in order to increase the penalties for careless death versus careless uh, driving causing death or bodily harm. It comes with up to a $50,000 penalty up to two years imprisonment and a license suspension for up to five years. This is a new charge that was not previously available to our enforcement officers, and it provides them with a strong tool, one that they have asked for and will help them to respond to these serious collisions in a very meaningful way. It does take time to enact the bill. Officers need to be trained. IT systems need to be changed so that they can respond to this. This is uh, not enacted yet until Answer. those very necessary pieces are doing. But this new charge is the first of its kind in Canada, incredibly important to our road users. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, Bill 37 defines and expands who vulnerable road users are. Your law does not do that. It does mandatory license suspension, mandatory community service, mandatory driver training, and the offender must appear in a court for a victim impact statement. Right now, people who are injured or killed in this province, their families do not even get their day in court. And so it is incredibly disappointing that the minister would claim that the new careless driving offence is a true vulnerable road user. Law. It is not, especially after I told her about Anthony Smith, who was here on Tuesday. He was a cyclist who's, who, who was seriously injured in, a, in an accident. He, he had 100 medical appointments. 
The driver got a $125 fine. Surely we can come to some common ground that this is not acceptable. Question. Will, will this government finally acknowledge that you do not have a vulnerable road user law that is comprehensive? And will you fast track Bill 37? You only have 12 Thank more you. days to do it. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And I think that the member opposite misses the fact that we've heard from enforcement officers. They will use the tool. This is what they've been asking for, and they are looking for the full enactment of this tool to keep our vulnerable road safety users. It is there in the sentencing. It allows the, the uh, judge to uh, decide on the penalty, deciding on what uh, issue is in front of them. But for the families, for our most vulnerable road users, including children and seniors and cyclists, we have a duty to do more and to do better. We will continue to ensure that the officers and the justice system have the tools that they need to look after all road users. A new offence for careless driving causing death or bodily harm is exactly what they were asking for to do that. Answer. We will continue to also to advocate to each and every road user in this province that it's up to all of us to ensure that all of us get home safely at the end of the day. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. And over the past decade, our government has taken positive steps to reduce poverty and support low-income individuals in Ontario. However, while Ontario's economy is strong, I know that not everyone is experiencing the same opportunities. And in my riding of Beaches East York, I have heard from constituents and anti-poverty advocates about the need to make substantial changes to our income security system. I've met regularly with interfaith leaders from our community who, on behalf of their congregations, believe that the 2008 election, election should be about voting to end poverty. And that's why, Speaker, guided by recommendations put forward by the Income Security Working Group and uh, feedback from the public, we are moving toward a system that Question. is more fair, supportive, and puts the needs of the person at the centre. Will the speaker, sorry, will the minister, Speaker, please tell this House about our plans for continuing to support low-income Ontarians? Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services, Minister of Community and Social Services, Minister responsible for NT. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for uh, the question. On this side of the House, we believe that uh, fun we believe fundamentally that reform is necessary when we talk about income uh, security. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the uh, advocates who worked on the security work group with us to build the roadmap. Um, more than 900 of them uh, right across uh, the province who shared their ideas on how we can better position Ontario when it comes to supports for low-income Ontarians. You know, I'm pleased, Mr. Speaker, um, to be part of a government that in its budget has committed uh, $2.3 billion over the next three years uh, for these substantial reforms. This is a, a huge contrast, Mr. Speaker, uh, from when the Conservatives were in power, and we know that um, uh, the former Conservative government uh, made uh, over almost 25 percent cut uh, Ooh, to supports for uh, low-income Ontarians, Answer. people who are injured, people who uh, are sick, people who can't work, and uh, we have an opposite approach because we believe the best investment <laughs> is investment into our— Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his exemplary work on making sure that all Ontarians get to participate fully in our society. Because our government, Speaker, knows that there is a need to make real change to reduce poverty in the province. It costs less to support inclusion and a better quality of life to prevent illnesses and to keep people from falling further behind. And I know that many anti-poverty advocates are proud of this government's unprecedented investments to support low-income Ontarians. In fact, Neil Hetherington, the CEO of Daily Bread Food Bank, says, with the measures in this budget, there are substantial commitments that help reduce barriers for people living in poverty. This budget sets the stage for serious transformation of our province's income security system. Speaker, Mr. Haddington couldn't be more right. So, Speaker, will the minister tell the House what other improvements Question. this budget will include to help support low-income Ontarians? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, over the next three years, we'll see a 9% uh, increase uh, in ODSB and Ontario Works here in the province of Ontario. And I think Ontarians need to pay attention to uh, what comes forward in the next few weeks in regards to our budget and this commitment and what the alternatives uh, proposed by other uh, parties, Cuts. in particular the uh, progressive conservatives. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, 
I think the best, uh, the best uh, understanding on how uh, well um, we do as a society here in Ontario is how well uh, we work with those who need uh, help. Yeah. You know, someone who's uh, injured themselves on the, the workforce, someone who, uh, you know, because of uh, challenge can't get to, to work to do the type of work uh, to pull in uh, the type of income necessary for yes, their sir. family. When you have a progressive conservative government that was in power that cut almost 25 percent off of that vulnerable. funding line, to me, uh, people. people need to Thank pay you. attention because. Thank you. No question. The member from Thorn Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a question for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. We have a, a chronic uh, problem in access to French language services and a very uh, good solution for the lack of uh, professionals will be education in French for students in Ontario that could join uh, the public service and does provide a solution for this lack of service. Unfortunately, uh, there's not enough teachers of French in our system, and this government was told by experts that this was a problem, that uh, uh, budget cuts uh, cost problems to training for French language teachers. Last month, I asked the Minister of Education if she has a plan but she does not have a response. There's no response. For the minister, thank you for the question. It's always a pleasure to speak in French and answer in French questions in French. We are very proud of the, what we've done, our government does for the Francophones in Ontario and elsewhere. There's always more to do, that's true. And in this, uh, at this moment, we see in the school system how dynamic our teachers are and te uh, parents that choose education, immersion education. It's really extraordinary what uh, happens. So we must be very proud of this success. For me, what's important, Mr. Speaker, it's to work with our school boards. I know that the Minister of Education has a plan, and uh, together with our predecessor, Minister Hunter, and Naidu Ares, my present colleague, and they continue to work with the school system to develop a system that will help to improve the situation. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the government notice of motion number five relating to allocation of time on Bill 6, an act to enact the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services Act 2018 and the Correctional Services and uh, Reintegration Act of 2018 to make related amendments to other acts and to repeal an act and to revoke a regulation. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
beautiful. All members, please take your seats. <laughs> On April the 11, 2018, Mr. Leal moved uh, go government notice of motion number five relating to allocation of time on Bill 6, an act to enact the Ministry of Community and Safety and Correctional Services Act 2018 and the Correctional Services and Reintegration Act 2018 to make related amendments to other acts to repeal the act and to revoke a regulation. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Mr. Meridi. Mr. Meridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Ms. Darmer. Ms. Darmer. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The eyes are 48, the knees are 26. The eyes being 48 and the knees being 26, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 3, an act of respecting transparency of pay and employment. Call on the members. This will be a five minute bill. On March 26, 2018, Mr. Flynn moved to second reading of Bill 3, an act respecting transparency of uh, pay in employment. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Don. Mr. Don. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tavis. Mr. Tavis. Mr. Nadishai. Mr. Nadishai. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. 
All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. The eyes are 57, the nays are 18. The eyes being 57, the nays being 18, I declare the motion carried. Deuxième lecture du projet de loi. Pursuant to the order of the House dated April 11, 2018, the bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. Point of order, the member from Ottawa South. Senator Senator's jerseys would like to meet all those in lease jerseys out in the hall after we're done. Just two reminders. <laughs> Thank you, member from St. Catharines. Just a uh, Two quick reminders. Uh, I've been asked to remind people to return jerseys from people that you've borrowed them from. The legislators need to have them. <laughs> and a uh, reminder that uh, as a sign of our, uh, uh, our respect, we would like to take a picture of all of the members in the uh, main staircase, uh, and we'll provide that to uh, Humboldt, uh, Humboldt and uh, the Saskatchewan legislature. Thank you very much. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.